Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm thankful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And we'll discuss some of the salient features of what is the role of newer markers, newer virological markers, because there is a whole set of immunological markers also. That is a, another very lengthy talk. So I will discuss the role of newer virological markers in management of chronic hepatitis B. So this will be the outline. First, we will discuss what are those newer virological markers, what is the basic science behind them, and what is the potential clinical utility, and have they been incorporated in, in, in any of the clinical practice guidelines. So these are the conventional markers, which we know, HBSAG, HBSAG quant, E antigen, NTHBE, DNA, and genotype. These are the conventional markers. And these are the upcoming new markers, HBB, RNA, correlated antigen and various forms of HBSAG that we will see. So what is the need for new biological markers? So we all know that HPV is very difficult to eliminate due to the CCC DNA persistence. And this intrahepatic CCC DNA measurement requires invasive liver biopsy. And the cirrhosis and HCC can occur in spite of undetectable DNA and HBSAG. So there is always a need for accurate prediction of the response before and after cessation of interferon or nucleoside analogs, which patients will develop HCC, what is the potential for HBV reactivation, and what reinfection can occur after liver transplantation, what are the factors, and development of new drugs also requires these biological markers. So what is the basic science? So this is the whole virion. There are three parts. Outside there is envelope, which again has and three types of angular proteins, small, large, and medium. This is the capsid, and inside the capsid, there is a genome. This is the complete virion, but there are many incomplete forms also circulating throughout the blood. This is, if all these three are present, that is a complete virion. The virion, the uh, genome in the normal is RC, that is relaxed circular DNA. So if all these three are present, it is the complete virion. If only the envelope is present, these are called subviral particles. If only capsid and HBSAG envelope is present without any genome, it is empty virion. If another type of genome is present, for example, pre-genomic RNA or other types of RNAs, then it, these are RNA virions. Then there are RNA capsids. And if another type of genome that is linear DNA is present, these are called the double-strand linear DNAs. So let's see the life cycle. So once the virus enters, relaxed circular DNA is released, which goes into the liver, into the nucleus, and CCC DNA is formed. Transcription occurs, various messenger RNAs are formed. They come out of the nucleus, then translation occurs. So first, core and the core is, is assembled into the capsid. Next, the pre-genomic RNA goes inside the capsid. Then reverse transcription occurs, single-stranded DNA is formed, then the double-stranded relaxed circular DNA is formed, then it acquires the envelope and then secreted. So there are five kinds of HPV messenger RNA that we have to know because HPV RNA is a very valuable marker. 3.5 kilo base pre-genomic, 3.5 kilo base pre-core. L messenger RNA, MS messenger RNA, and X messenger RNA. These are the five types of MRN that produce various types of particles. Now, which is the most common type of RNA circulating in the, uh, in the blood of patients? Pre-genomic RNA, that is the about 90 to 95% of the RNA circulating is the pre-genomic type. And these are the various forms that are circulating in the blood. HBV RNA containing capsids, whole virions containing the HBV RNA, and extracellular vesicles, which is a very minor component. And also various types of pregenomic RNAs are formed, whole pregenomic RNA, truncated and spliced. There are no standardized methods available as yet for serum HPV RNA detection. Different studies have uh, used different me methods, but they are basically based on the PCR type of procedure. And different PCR primers have been used. So actually they are, what they are measuring is, known, uh, is not known or various types of RNAs are being measured, but most of the studies are measuring the 3.5 kilobit uh, KB uh, pre-genomic RNA. Most of the studies have used this type of RNA measurement. 
Now, what about core-related antigen? <clears throat> this is the pre-core core gene, and as we can see, core-related antigen measures actually three things: HBC core, hepatitis B core antigen, hepatitis B E antigen, and P22 core-related antigen. Uh, these depend; uh, these uh, are produced according to where from where the translation and transcription are starting. And there is a um, Chemo uh, luminescent enzyme immunoassay available from a Japanese company, uh, not yet available in India, but it can be imported. Now, let us see what are the various HBSAG forms. So, this is the genome of uh, surface antigen pre S1, pre S2, and S. If all three are present, it is large. If these two are present, it is medium. If only small is present, it is small. There is also a ELISA-based technique available with, again, from a Japanese company, which can measure all these three accordingly. So what is the potential clinical utility? First, we will discuss what is in the untreated patients. And it has been shown from a US and Canadian study that higher levels of RNA and correlated antigen are found in E-antigen positive and immune active phases of E-antigen negative. They correlate very strongly with HBV DNA in both E positive and E negative patients. They correlate strongly with surface antigen levels in E antigen positive only, but not in E antigen negative. And these, both these markers correlate with higher ALT, EPRI, and fibrosis scores. But in effect, they have limited additional value in differentiating various phases because they all they correlate with HBV DNA levels, HBSAG levels, and all the clinical disease indicators. So if we look this look on this study from China, among E antigen positive patients, serum correlated antigen is correlating very well with intrahepatic CCC DNA. Uh, e antigen positive, uh, the intrahepatic CCC DNA correlates also with surface antigen, HBV RNA and HBV DNA, but mostly it is correlating very well with correlated antigen. Whereas in E antigen negative, intrahepatic CCC DNA correlates very well with correlated antigen and less so with the HBS antigen, but does not correlate with HBV RNA. So correlated antigen is a very important marker for intrahepatic CCC DNA. So what happens to patients on treatment? As we can see from this study, we showed that by year five, none of the patients were having positive DNA, 14% were having positive pre-genomic RNA and 27% positive correlated antigen. So in effect, it means that first marker to go is HBV DNA, then HBV RNA goes, then correlated antigen, and lastly, HBS antigen is going to go away. So this was a study from again from China. We showed that among E antigen positive patients, the factors predicting clinical relapse after stopping treatment, HBS AG levels were not predictive, whereas RNA levels and correlated antigen levels, these two were very predictive of the clinical relapse after stopping uh, therapy. And they formed a risk score according to HBV RNA and correlated antigen levels. And they divided into low, medium, and high risk. And as can be seen, the low risk group, there was no clinical relapse, whereas uh, in medium and high risk, the real clinical relapse was Similarly, this risk score could also predict HBSAG loss in the low risk group, 16% HBSAG loss, whereas in the medium and high risk group, only 1.3% HBSAG loss. Similarly, in PEG interferon treated patients, in E antigen positive patients, HBV RNA at week 12 remained a very good predictor of zero conversion to PEG interferon therapy, as we can see. At week 12, these were the four factors that were uh, associated with zero conversion at a later date. And as the number of factors increase, if four, all the four factors are present, then 95% of the patient achieve zero conversion. Similarly, medium HBSAG levels also predict HBSAG in E antigen positive patients. And these become negative six months before HBSAG loss. So these can be a factor that can be predictive of future HBSAG loss in on patients with nucleoside analogs and PEG interferon. And similarly, in E negative patients, detectable core antigen and RNA predict severe clinical flares after stopping therapy. And as we can see, 
correlated antigen was positive in 17% and RNA was positive in 13% at the time of stopping and all the patients developed clinical flare. So this could be a very valuable marker uh, to select patients uh, in which to stop therapy. Similarly, even among patients in whom HBSAG has been lost and they have stopped inter uh, nucleoside analog therapy, as can be seen, all the patients were actually positive by HBSAG ultra sensitive assay. So the common assay which, by which we measure HBSAG may not be sensitive enough. And correlated antigen was present in none, whereas the RNA was positive in two, two patients and all both these patients developed flare on follow up, even if at the time of stopping their HBSAG was negative. So there have been studies in HCC prevention also. Uh, these studies show that if the baseline HBV RNA is elevated, then they have a higher risk of development of HCC in the future, even on NA therapy. And similarly, high correlated antigen levels at one year on nucleoside analog therapy, they also predict that patients are more likely to develop HCC in the future. Similarly, when patients undergo resection for HCC, high serum pregenomic RNA uh, at the time of resection could end high poorer overall survival rates and high recurrence rates after resection. Now, there is also higher risk of HCC development if the medium type of HBSAG forms start accumulating in the blood of the patients. So at follow-up, if there is a 25% increase in medium HBSAG levels, then HCC is more likely to develop. So why are these related to HCC development? Because persistent of these markers indicate that there is a high viral transcription going on, there is high ER stress, high CCC DNA levels, and HBV pregenomic RNA has also been shown to upregulate the expression of insulin-like growth factors, which ultimately leads to HCC development. So this study also shows that there is a risk of HBV reactivation on patients who are HBSAG negative, poor positive, and undergoing high-risk immunosuppressive therapy. If patients are baseline HB core positive or HB core positive at more than one time point, then they have a very high risk of HBV reactivation. So maybe this can, these markers can help us stratify patients according to the risk of HBV reactivation. And what about liver transplant setting? We know that after liver transplant, HBSAG and HBV DNA will become negative mostly after one year or so. But despite being negative, core antigen and CCC DNA remain positive in about 50%, meaning that HBV re reinfection has occurred in those new livers also. And interestingly, fibrosis stage was significantly lower in patients who were negative for both these markers, that is HBV as core antigen related antigen and CCC DNA than in patients who were positive. So uh, what about new drug discovery? Before we go to on to the this, we, I need to uh, tell you about the double strand linear DNA. We have seen that through this pathway, relaxed circular DNA is formed, but there is an alternate pathway also after encapsidation and single stranded DNA formation. Some of these is diverted into double strand linear DNA, and this goes into the uh, nucleus and is integrated into the host DNA. Why is this important? Because HBSAG can be derived from both CCC DNA and integrated DNA. So from CCC DNA, this HBSAG is arising and from integrated DNA, uh, this is arising. But the HBSAG which is arising from here, it does not support the replication. So there is a possibility that even if CCC DNA is negative in the liver, HBSAG still can remain positive. So that is, that brings some, us to the question whether HBSAG is a, actually a valid marker for complete cure or not. So, okay, for new drug discovery, there are various, uh, uh, various molecules under development and these markers can be valuable in assessing those responses. I will not go into the details. And uh, Japanese Society of Hepatology has included uh, these markers for stopping nucleoside analogs therapy. And 
they show they, they say that if patient criteria and laboratory criteria are fulfilled in patients who have mild degree of fibrosis then nucleoside analogs can be stopped based on hbsag levels and correlated antigen at the time of cessation and they have defined accordingly low risk group and high risk group in low risk groups cessation may be considered in high risk groups continue and in moderate risk group go uh, case to case basis so to summarize ladies and gentlemen there are actually many potential areas of utility of these newer markers but we need to generate indian data because the genotypes are different here different time of infection is there and these new virological markers are still in the research phase and they are not yet ready for clinical application thank you very much